Hello, everybody. Welcome. My name is Mike Reapy. As a UC Santa Cruz Alumni Council member, I'd like to welcome you to our monthly speaker series, Slugs and Steins, Lectures from UC Santa Cruz. For those who are new, our Slugs and Steins series engages a UC Santa Cruz faculty member in discussions with you, the local community of Silicon Valley, and our extended community online, with the goal of making all of us Renaissance women and men. We want it to feel just like you're at UC Santa Cruz sitting in class, but with drinks and without tests. David, another volunteer organizer, is with me tonight. We're both alumni and we spend our days in entrepreneurial companies, Silicon Valley style. He'll be helping me with the Q&A and you'll hear more from him at the end of the talk. Before we get started, we'd like to take a poll to get to know our audience and where you're tuning in from this evening. So please take a few moments. The poll should be up on your screen now. Just uh, answer these questions that pop up. We're share, we'll share the results after we've given everyone a moment to respond. Just a couple more moments. Uh, I think we're ready to, to post those responses. Um, yep, you should be able to see where we're coming from. 69% uh, just one person. Uh, I'd say we're, we're pretty evenly spread here, about a third from Santa Cruz County, a third from the Bay Area, uh, and the rest of people from around California and even uh, outside the United States, 13%. That's amazing. Um, so tonight, we raise a virtual stein with Professor Emeritus George Blumenthal, UC Santa Cruz's 10th Chancellor. Uh, he joined the campus in 1972 as a faculty member in astronomy and astrophysics and he served as chancellor from 2007 until 2019. As a theoretical astrophysicist, Professor Blumenthal made pathbreaking contributions to our understanding of the origins of structure in the universe, including galaxies and clusters of galaxies, and to the role that dark matter plays in the formation and evolution of this structure. He is co-author of two textbooks, 21st Century Astronomy and Understanding Our Universe. His, ten his tenure as chancellor was marked by a commitment to ensuring that the doors of opportunity at UC Santa Cruz are open to all, with underrepresented student enrollment increasing by 50% under his watch. After retiring as chancellor, he stepped into the role of director of the Center for Studies in Higher Education at UC Berkeley. If you have questions for our professor, please type them in, the, in Zoom's Q&A box uh, down at the bottom. Uh, you don't need to wait until the last minute to type your question. As soon as you think of it, you can type it at any time, and we'll uh, and we'll get to them roughly in the order that we see them. If you see someone else's question that you like, you can upvote it, and we'll ask it sooner. This talk is being recorded. In a few days, you'll be able to find it on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel. We'll post the link in our social media channels and our follow-up emails. Okay, does everyone have your Stein? Great, I've got your slug, Professor Emeritus George Blumenthal. Thank you so much, Mike. Let me share the screen. It will take just a second. Great. Can you see it okay? Yes, we're seeing it. Great, super. Well, thank you, and thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and I very much look forward to spending part of the evening together with all of you. I want to talk today about a century of paradigm shifts in our thinking about the universe. And the first question you could ask me is, why a century? Why, why, why would I, if I want to talk about changes in our thinking about the universe, why devote 100 years to it? And the answer is, is really simple. The, the answer is that before 100 or really more like 110 years, uh, ago, there was no self-consistent model for the universe. We could talk about the large scale universe, we can say those words, but there was no mathematical model that was really self-consistent, that didn't have internal inconsistencies um, or paradoxes associated with it. So what happened 100 years ago or 110 years ago? And the end, well, first let me say what we want. We want a universe that's number one, self-consistent, not no internal paradoxes. We want to think about a universe that's predictive, that can make predictions that can be tested. In other words, 
models that can be ruled out if the observations don't accord with them. And we also prefer to have models that are right. That's kind of nice to do models that will pass the tests. Um, so um, the real first paradigm shift in our understanding came with Einstein and his development of general theory of relativity, which is a theory of gravity. But it was, and since gravity is the dominant force in the largest scales of the universe, it's a natural thing to, to use to try to understand the largest scale universe. And Einstein realized that. So he actually tried to solve for the universe and much to his chagrin, he discovered that the universe was expanding or contracting. It couldn't stay steady. It just couldn't stay. The universe had ADT or ADHT. It couldn't stay still. It either expanded or contracted. And he didn't like that at all um, because his belief was that the universe should, is forever and should be static. And so he went back to the drawing boards and he said, something must be wrong with my theory of relativity. So he went back to the drawing boards and found a way to generalize his theory of general relativity, to add an extra term in the equations and an extra constant of nature, which he called the cosmological constant. And he found that with the cosmological constant, it was actually possible to solve for a universe that neither expanded nor contracted. And he did this all around 1915 or so. And so, you know, he had found his static universe. Now we now know that that the Einstein universe was not a good model either because it was unstable. You could either, if you, if you lived in such a universe and you sneezed, the whole universe would start to expand or contract. But still, he at least found a static universe. And then nothing much happened until the late 1920s, more than a decade later, when Edwin Hubble discovered that the universe is expanding. And what Hubble did is he looked at a bunch of galaxies around us measured how fast they were moving and found that galaxies were expanding or moving away from us. And the further away those galaxies were, the faster they were moving away from us. And so that became the basis of what's now called Hubble's law. And by galaxies, I mean things that look like this. Uh, this is a picture rather similar to our Milky Way, a galaxy similar to our Milky Way. And these are the things that he saw moving away from us. So how did he get those data? Well, he, he measured, he, he gave plots of velocity versus distance. And on top, on the top of this uh, slide, you can see the original data that Hubble had, uh, and which wasn't that great as, as data goes. Uh, today, a, a similar plot made with data today is the bottom picture. And just to give you an idea of the quality improvement in the data, um, in, the time, in the little corner down here at the very, bottom left of this figure, that little, that little uh, rectangle there is the entire data set that Hubble used uh, to do his, uh, to, to discover Hubble's law. So Hubble's law is now well established. Uh, there, very few people would doubt the truth of Hubble's law at this point. Um, but of course, Hubble, discovering that the universe is expanding makes some people feel as though, well, does that mean we're at the center of the universe? And the answer to that question is a resounding no. That's not what it means. Um, because uh, let me use a very simple example to, to explain that to you. Imagine a, a rubber band that has a bunch of uh, paper clips sitting on it. And let that rubber band be kind of a one-dimensional universe. And imagine that and each of those paper clips, say, re re uh, is, is reflecting a galaxy. Is, is, is supposed to be a galaxy. Now imagine that you were an ant that lived on one of those paper clips, for example, paper, oops, paper clip number A. If you're that ant and somebody starts to stretch the rubber band, you'll see all of the nearby paper clips moving away from you. And in fact, the further away from you those paper clips are, the more rubber band there is, and therefore the faster they'll move away from you. From you. So under this model of the expanding rubber band, this ant would discover that there's a Hubble law for the expansion of paper clips. But a separate ant living over here on, the other, on a different paper clip would also observe that nearby paper clips are moving away from him. And that ant would also discover an expansion of the universe and a law like Hubble's law. So Hubble's law by its very nature does not mean 
that we live in the center of the universe. It simply means that the universe of all galaxies is expanding with galaxies getting further and further away from each other at all times. So Hubble's law was, was an crucial discovery. It didn't profoundly mean that we were at the center of the universe because that's not what it means, but it still is a fundamental statement about the nature of our universe and the fact that our universe is dynamic. It's changing, it's expanding. And of course, Hubble, I'm sorry, of course, Einstein realized that he could have predicted this. In fact, he sometimes say that his greatest mistake was uh, introducing the cosmological constant because he could have simply predicted that the universe was expanding and he would have beat Hubble by you know, more than a decade had he done so. So um, he regarded that as his biggest mistake of his career. And I have a little teaser here and saying, well, is it really? And we'll come back to that because history has a way of folding back upon itself, as you'll see um, as we get on with the story. So you know, what, what I just described, the discovery of the expansion of the universe happened in 1929. And then not a whole lot happened for nearly two decades. And in 1948, two important papers were written and they were both attempts to change the paradigm of our understanding of the universe. And one of those papers was a paper by uh, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. Um, and um, they suggested the following. They said, look, if the universe is expanding, expanding stuff cools off as it expands. Gas ex cools as it expands. So if the universe is expanding, it must be cooling. And therefore, if the universe is cooling, that means that at some earlier time, the universe was hotter maybe even much, much hotter. And so they questioned or they, they uh, proposed that um, the early universe was very hot, that it was in thermal equilibrium and therefore would produce radiation that would today cool and be radiation in the microwave region of the spectrum. So they predicted a kind of microwave background radiation that would encompass everything in the universe. But they also went further than that. Remember, this was 1948. This was like three years after the end of World War II. And um, uh, they, uh, they were just starting to understand nuclear physics. And so the idea they also came up with was that maybe all of the elements in the universe heavier than hydrogen were produced in nuclear reactions in the early universe. Because if the early universe was very, very hot, the particles, the nuclei would have enough energy to initiate fusion reactions and maybe the fact that we have iron and helium and oxygen and all those nice heavier elements came from the fact that nuclear reactions happened in the early universe. So they put together that theory about, of what has now become called, become known as the hot big bang. And of course, because this is science, this, we had to test this. So um, one of the students of, uh, of Gamow uh, went out and tried to measure this microwave background radiation and failed to find it. They thought this radiation would be at a temperature of five to 10 degrees. They simply couldn't detect it. Um, we now know they didn't have the technology to really detect it. So that was a failure. And pretty much this idea was abandoned for the next oh, 17 or so years. So that was one thing that happened in 1948. Another thing that happened in 1948 was that two scientists who met in a displaced persons camp after World War II, uh, Herman Bondi and Tommy Gold, came up with an alternative idea for the, for the universe. They proposed what became known as the steady state universe. And um, in the steady state universe, the universe is indeed expanding, but new matter is being created all the time to fill in for all of the old matter that's being expanded away so that the universe in effect is un unchanging even though it's expanding. And that became known as the steady state universe. And it had its, its strong advocates, including Fred Hoyle, who later became the Astronomer Royal of Britain. And so for really the next 17 or so years, uh, uh, there was a battle between these two ideas about the universe. On the one hand was the idea of the Big Bang universe of, uh, of, of Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. And on the other hand 
was the steady st state in the universe of Bondi and Gold. Interestingly enough, uh, um, the term Big Bang Universe was coined by Fred Hoyle, and he actually meant it as a term of derision. He, he meant it as a put down of that model, but it stuck. And today we use it as simply a descriptor of the Big Bang Universe, and also a TV show, not to mention another thing. So that battle raged for years. I remember growing up. And you read all these articles about the Big Bang universe versus the steady state universe. But effectively, all of those discussions came to an end in 1965, because in 1965, something really remarkable happened. Two scientists at Bell Labs, which is essentially the telephone company, were, were doing some experiments. Uh, they were bouncing microwave signals off of the first communication satellite which was called Echo One. Uh, Echo One was nothing more sophisticated than a humongous balloon that had been put in orbit. It was so large, you could actually see it with your naked eye. In fact, I can remember going out in my parents' backyards when I was a teenager and, uh, and actually watching, uh, um, watching the satellite pass uh, near the horizon. You could see it near the horizon at sunrise or sunset. And um, anyway, these two guys, Penzias and Wilson, were bouncing signals off of microwave signals off of this satellite, and they were getting back too much reflected signal, and they couldn't figure it out. They thought it might be bird droppings on their antenna. They did everything possible. And finally, somebody suggested to them, maybe this is radiation left over from the Big Bang. They basically from the prediction that Alpha, Beta, and Gamma had made. Well, it turned out uh, that idea caught hold and has become quite accepted today. And it basically was the death knell for the steady state universe because um, the steady state universe has no way of predicting something like this microwave background radiation. So, um, so at least for the moment, the steady state universe was completely dead. And there was a general consensus that our universe is described by this hot big bang universe that, um, that, that was uh, originated by alpha, beta, and gamma. Um, and it was tested. So for years after the discovery, people questioned whether this microwave background radiation was truly thermal radiation. Well, uh, the graph that I'm showing here is uh, a graph of what thermal radiation should look like at a temperature of 2.7 degrees above absolute zero. And you may not be able to see it, but one of the subsequent satellites that looked at this radiation, the COBE satellite, actually measured the spectrum. And the data points from the COBE satellite are superimposed on this graph. And the error bars or the uncertainties in those measurements are so small that they're thinner than the line. So to really high precision, subsequent experiments prove that in fact, this radiation that Penzias and Wilson had found was indeed the microwave background radiation at a temperature of 2.7 degrees. So this was a remarkable conclusion, um, but there were still a few loose ends that kept people studying the universe up at night worrying. And, um, and people knew we weren't done yet. And one of the reasons we knew we weren't done yet was because of something called dark matter. So I wanna spend a few minutes talking about dark matter which was another kind of revolution in the way that we think about the universe around us. Um, what is dark matter? Well, by definition, dark matter is matter, it has mass, it has gravity, but you can't see it, it's dark. It neither emits nor absorbs light. Um, so if it neither emits nor absorbs light, how do we detect it? Well, the answer is we detect, detect it through its gravity. It does exert a gravitational influence. And as I'll mention in a minute, we subsequently learned that visible matter, the stuff that we're made out of, that our planet is made out of, the stuff that we, we know in our daily lives only constitutes about 15% of the mass in the universe, the rest of the mass being dark matter. So how do we know that? Well, some of the um, earliest evidence came from looking at how galaxies rotate. As galaxies rotate, you expect the stars as they rotate to obey 
the laws of physics, Kepler's laws of physics, uh, the same laws that determine how stars move around the sun, or sorry, how, how planets move around the sun. So um, you expect that to work just fine. Well, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, using radio astronomy, uh, astronomers, in particular Vera Rubin, who's pictured here, um, did measurements of the rotation of the galaxy. And what they found was that although the inner parts of the galaxy fairly closely matched what they predicted the rotation should be of the galaxy, the outer parts rotated much, much faster than you expect based upon the amount of material that you see in the disk of a galaxy. You can measure, when you see stars in the disk of a galaxy, you can guess, or you can measure what their mass is, and knowing the mass of those stars, you should be able to predict how fast the galaxy is rotating. And the observations were really different. The galaxy is rotating much faster in its outer regions than is predicted from normal Kepler's law. So what does that mean? Well, that means one of two things. It could mean that the laws of physics are wrong, which is certainly possible, or it could mean that there's more mass there than you thought. And that's the interpretation because of a whole bunch of other measurements as well that seems to make the most sense, that there's an extra component to the mass of galaxies, which we now call dark matter. And that's one piece of evidence. There's other pieces of evidence for dark matter as well. So for example, what I'm showing you here is a cluster of galaxies. Galaxies cluster together in groups that can contain anywhere from a few galaxies up to thousands or tens of thousands of galaxies. What I'm showing you here is a fairly rich cluster of galaxies. I don't remember, somewhere between three and 10,000 galaxies in this cluster. And on the right, you see what the, what the cluster looks like in ordinary optical light. That's a picture of the cluster of galaxies. And the fuzzy things that you see are all galaxies. On the left is a picture of that same cluster taken with x-rays. And the x-ray picture shows that there's a lot of x-ray emission, but the x-ray emission is diffuse. It comes from gas in the cluster of galaxies. And that gas has to be very, very hot. It has to literally be hundreds of millions of degrees uh, Kelvin, or very, you know, in other words, extremely hot. So hot that the gas would not be contained by the gravity due to the galaxies that we see in the, in the cluster. The cluster needs about 10 times more mass to hold on to the gas that you see in the left-hand uh, picture. So in order to contain that hot gas, that's another piece of evidence that dark matter exists, not just in individual galaxies, but in clusters of galaxies as a whole. And in fact, an even more dramatic uh, piece of evidence comes from this cluster, again, another cluster of galaxies. But what you see in this cluster, if you look closely, is there are arcs here. You can see very, very faint blue arcs. Those arcs are, are the result of the mass of the cluster bending the light from background galaxies. So there are galaxies behind the cluster whose light is being focused by or bent by the gravitational influence of the cluster. Uh, this is a prediction of general relativity. And in fact, um, uh, those arcs, uh, in order for them to exist, that tells you something about the mass in the cluster. And once again, the mass that you need in order to get those arcs is about 10 times as much as you see using visible light in the cluster or visible or X-ray light in the cluster. So that's another piece of evidence for dark matter on a different scale in the universe. So the evidence for dark matter is quite powerful. And I've only given you a few pieces of evidence for it here. There are many more. But the point is this was a revolution in our understanding of the universe to understand that most of the universe isn't even the stuff that comprise our bodies or our planet. It's something else, something that we can see, cannot see, something that doesn't emit or absorb light and something that interacts very weakly with other forms of matter except through gravity. So um, what does that mean? Well, that started a whole new revolu revolu revolution in our understanding of the universe. Um, because up until this time, while we might have understood something about the expansion of the universe, we really didn't understand how structure formed in the universe. 
And the fact that there was dark matter was a clue to how structure formed in the universe. And one, my colleagues and I at UC Santa Cruz actually followed that clue or, or followed it with the assumption that um, the dark matter consisted of something that we call cold dark matter. And cold dark matter is dark matter in the sense that it interacts very weakly except through uh, gravity. The cold means that whatever the dark matter stuff is, its velocity, its random motions are relatively small compared to uh, um, uh, the, the motions that you would get through gravity. So that the motions of the particles themselves play little role in their evolution. That's what makes the material cold. And um, so we know it doesn't consist of things like protons and electrons because such matter would be interactive with light and with each other. And there are various models for what cold dark matter could be. One idea is something as a particle called the photino, um, which has never yet been discovered, although there are currently experiments going on at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva looking for photinos. Another model for cold dark matter is something called the axion. The point is there are models for what it might be, but in truth, to this date, the particle that is cold dark matter has not yet been discovered. But cold dark matter um, leads to some really remarkable predictions in terms of large scale structure of the universe. And that's the work that I did with my colleagues, Sandy Faber and Joel Premack at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, cold dark matter correctly predicts the sizes of galaxies in the universe. That was a remarkable result. And I even remember the day that um, I took some of the models that I had calculated of cold dark matter and uh, Joel Premack had gotten some data from Sandy Faber on real galaxies and brought it to my office. And we, th th these were still the days when you used graph paper for some, for some things. And we overlaid the two graphs and they matched perfectly. It was quite an amazing experience. So cold dark matter does predict what the sizes of galaxies should be. They also predict what the irregularities should be in the microwave background radiation. What you see on the left here is a picture of the sky in the microwave region where um, the people who made this picture have amplified variations in the microwave background by a factor of 100,000. That is to say the microwave background is remarkably uniform over the entire sky, remarkably uniform. But if you look at finer and finer details, or if you multiply or, or if you amplify variations by a factor of 100,000, you can see variations from place to place in the universe. And that's what this uh, graph on, or with this picture on the left illustrates. Well, you can quantify those variations. And if you quantify those variations, it turns out that that matches exactly what was predicted from our cold dark matter models as well. So that was a great success for this new idea of how to form structure in the universe, that dark matter was the key. This is just another picture of, of the sky uh, in, microwave, in the microwave region. Um, this is a, a picture of the kinds of galaxies you'll get. This is a Hubble a deep space uh, uh, a picture of, uh, uh, of galaxies in the universe, looking at a relatively blank area of the sky. Virtually everything in this deep field is, is a galaxy. So um, there are a lot of galaxies in the universe that need to be explained. But, what you can also do is you can model the universe. And what Joel Premack and his colleagues did uh, was they did, um, they did simulations of what the universe should look like. This is an example of what you see coming out of some of these simulations uh, um, where at early times, Z, big Z means early time in the universe. At early times in the universe, the universe was pretty uniform. And then as the universe expands, you see more and more structure developing, kind of a sponge-like structure. And then you, that sponge-like structure becomes more pronounced. And today, the sponge-like structure yields voids, areas that are devoid of galaxies. It yields areas that have lots of galaxies that can become clusters. Um, so that's what the simulations show. They can even go into more detail. Um, on the left, um, this is just one of the boxes from one of those simulations. Remember, large Z means early time in the universe. So um, uh, you can see here how um, that simulation evolves over time and, and how structure forms 
over time as it goes to today. In fact, I'll play it again. So you can see the, the how structure is forming constantly uh, in the universe. Well, that's a nice pretty picture. Um, um, I could also ask, oops, I can also ask how does it compare to data? And um, so what you can do is you can take some data. In this case, what's shown on the left is a slice of the universe um, where going outward is distance from ourselves. And this is just a slice. Um, these are galaxies that are observed in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which tries to uh, observe as many galaxies as they can in the sky and have as complete a survey of galaxies as possible. And this is the structure we see in today's universe from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. And on the right, uh, what you can do is you can take one of these simulations and you can observe it just as though you were an observer observing through a telescope and uh, make your own equivalent of the Sloan Dig Digital Sky Survey. And if you do that, you get the map shown on the right. And as you can see, qualitatively, it's very, very similar to the map on the left. So it looks like the kind of structures you see in the large scale universe are very similar. And this again is one of the other successes of, of this cold dark matter theory uh, for structure formation in the universe. Well, this is all really good and, and very satisfying. And however, um, there, were, there are some more changes and some more paradigm shifts in front of us. And one of them came not long thereafter, not long after the cold dark matter uh, model was in effect. In fact, we kind of anticipated it. We anticipated the possibility of, uh, of, of the kind of result I'm going to describe, though we didn't feel confident enough to predict it. Um, and that is, it was found observationally that the expansion of the universe is accelerating. That was a remarkable result because um, you normally expect the expansion of the universe to slow down. You expect it to slow down because the universe is expanding, it's getting bigger, but there's gravity and gravity pulls things together. So you would expect that as the universe is expanding, it should start expanding slower and slower. That's what everybody expected. But instead, what people found was that the universe's expansion was actually accelerating. It was quite an amazing result. And as a result of that acceleration, uh, well, how do you measure that? The way that it was measured was to look at galaxies like this one that have supernovae of a particular type called supernova type 1a. And those supernova type 1a's tend to have a well-defined uh, luminosity. And so by measuring the brightness of, of these supernovae, um, astronomers could measure the um, distance to those galaxies and look at the deviations from Hubble's law. And what they found was that the universe was expanding, which means that they needed some ex something extra. And maybe that something extra was Einstein's cosmological constant. So in a sense, Einstein gets the last laugh because we now know that there is something there causing the universe's expansion to accelerate, much as the cosmological constant from Einstein would have done. So that's why I think Einstein does get the last laugh on this one. Um, today, we call this, uh, this, this physical factor that causes the universe to accelerate, we call it dark energy, because it might be more general. It may not be the same as Einstein's cosmological constant, or to say it a different way, the Einstein's cosmological constant might just be a special case of dark energy. So. Um, you know, this is a remarkable result. This says that the universe is, ex is accelerating. This result won the discoverers a Nobel Prize in physics, well-deserved, I might add. And um, uh, so what does all of this mean? Well, you know, there, are there issues with this? Yes, there are. You may have been reading in recent uh, uh, months that uh, Hubble's law appears to be inconsistent between the early universe and today. And that's entirely possible, but it just may mean that, um, that the dark energy is changing over time. Um, it doesn't in any way rule out the idea of dark energy or acceleration of the universe. It just means that it may be a little bit more complicated. In fact, 
If you were to ask naively how big is Einstein's cosmological constant if it exists, the answer is it would be hundred, literally more than a hundred orders of magnitude too big based upon simple estimates. So whatever, even if it were Einstein's cosmological constant, there's no natural way of understanding the size of Einstein's cosmological constant. Frankly, right now today, although there have been literally hundreds of papers written on dark energy, no one has yet explained uh, in, in a way that's kind of satisfying to all what that dark energy is. Um, if you look at the data, this is in a sense on, on the y-axis here is, is a measure of how much uh, dark energy there is or a value of the cosmological constant. On the x-axis here is a measure of what the density of the universe is. Um, the data uh, from the supernovae uh, fill in this, this yellow uh, limit here. Um, the What's called WMAP or measurements taken with uh, um, a, a satellite that measured the microwave background radiation, variations in that radiation does give you a measure of these parameters. And then the vertical uh, limits are from uh, clusters of galaxies. And you can see that um, pretty much there's convergent uh, convergence on how much of this cosmological constant or dark energy there has to be, and um, roughly what the uh, density of the universe has to be. So bottom line is when all is said and done, if you try to figure out, well, what are the components of the universe? How much of stuff is there? The answer is it's actually mostly dark energy. Dark energy constitutes most of the energy in the universe. Dark matter, which is something completely different, uh, constitutes about 23% of, of the stuff in the universe. And our ordinary matter, the stuff that makes up stars, planets, people, intergalactic gas, that's about 4% of the universe. So, uh, you know, we can argue about a percent or two here, but basically qualitatively, this is uh, the right kind of ratios that we, we do see, that we do observe. So our universe we discovered is much more mysterious than we ever uh, imagined. We only really understand this 4%. We don't yet know for sure exactly what the dark matter is. And we sure don't know what this dark energy stuff is. And the dark energy stuff is important because if you look at how the universe should be expanding, well, the, if, if the Big Bang happened here, the early universe was decelerating. But eventually dark energy or the cosmological constant made the universe start accelerating. And we live today at a time when the universe has been accelerating for a while, but not too long, which is really a fundamental point because the question is, why is dark energy of such a nature that only recently has the universe started ac accelerating? To me, that's one of the key question, qu questions that any theory of dark energy would have to explain. And as yet, I've not seen a really good explanation for that. So that's why I say I don't think we really have any good clue yet on exactly what dark energy is. Well, that's a lot to, to cover. That's a lot of things, but there's more. One other major paradigm shift that uh, happened around the same time that we were looking at models of forming structure in the universe was the idea of inflation. And um, I'd love to tell you a lot about inflation, but there just isn't time today. But what I would say is inflation is a very early time or the earliest time in the history of the universe when the universe expanded by a ginormous amount, huge amount of expansion. Um, and then that expansion slowed down and became kind of normal expansion. There are theories for what would cause that inflation in the early universe. Um, so there at least is some theoretical basis for it, but it's by no means proven theoretically. Uh, but if it's true, if inflation is true, then it has two, a uh, couple of remarkable implications. One is that um, quantum physics will have been important in the early universe to determine the initial deviations from homogeneity that ultimately led to galaxies and other structure in the universe. Until inflation came along, we had no really good model for what caused the in initial inhomogeneities in the universe. And, infl and inflation models tell us 
and it's quantum physics, which is kind of remarkable because if that is true, then quantum physics, which is you normally think of as affecting atoms or molecules or subatomic particles, if this is true, then quantum physics is really ultimately what's responsible for galaxies as a whole. And that's a remarkable result. So is inflation proven? No, it's by no means proven. It is testable. And so far it's passed a number of tests, but it faces a number of interesting observational tests going forward. So I think stay tuned in the next few years because I think we'll hear more and more about tests of inflationary models. Another um, interesting implication of inflation is the idea of eternal inflation, where big bangs are created all the time out of something that looks like a steady state universe. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. But that's another possible implication of inflation, which interestingly enough brings back something very similar to that old steady state universe that I mentioned near the beginning of my talk. So, let me turn to a, another topic that people love to wonder about, and that's the idea of multiverses or multiple universes. Are we living in the only universe possible? And, um, and the answer is maybe yes and maybe no. There are various types of multiverses you can imagine. I want to mention two. One I think is more mundane. This is the more mundane one that I want to mention now. Uh, we know we live in a universe which is very large, might even be infinite in size. And if it is very, very large or infinite in size, we also know that we can see out to a certain distance about 13.8 billion light years, call it 14 billion light years, because the universe's expansion is accelerating. We will never be able to see further than 14 billion light years, which means that we live in a bubble. We live in a region of the universe, even though this region will expand, we will never see beyond this region of the universe. And if the real universe is much, much bigger than our region of it, our bubble in it, then there's presumably other bubbles somewhere, which we can't see, that have stuff inside of it. Fine, no big deal. But if you think about it, our bubble of the universe is finite in size. It has only so many particles and only so many states of matter. And if the universe is very, very large or infinite in size, then um, there's only so many states in matter. And so if there's a lot of bubbles, eventually you'll find a bubble where all of the matter is in exactly the same state as it is in our universe. So if you go out far enough, you might expect to encounter another universe, which is identical to our own, where there's another George Blumenthal giving a boring lecture on Zoom. So, um, uh, uh, and you can, you can calculate how far away that other universe is. And its answer is it's about 10 to the 10 to the 115 million light years away. That's a long distance if, if in fact it exists at all. But in a way, this idea is not particularly radical. It all it requires is a big enough universe. A more radical idea is the one I alluded to before, which I think is actually quite interesting, which is eternal inflation. And the idea here is that um, the universe expands forever and it expands at an accelerating pace. It's always accelerating. But it, and it, every now and then in this universe, because of quantum effects, there's a fluctuation. There's a region that becomes a little denser than everything else around it. And because it comes a little bit denser, it stops expanding as fast and eventually will slow down and start to expand much less rapidly than the region around it. And that region, that, that fluctuation, inside of that fluctuation, it will give every appearance of being a Big Bang. And so if this model of eternal inflation is correct, then we live in such a region. And so our Big Bang is nothing more than one of an infinite number of Big Bangs that happen all the time. And that um, outside of the region of our Big Bang, the universe is just happily expanding away, um, it's exponentially expanding, doing its own thing. But um, every now and then, a region becomes more dense than its surroundings and will slow down in its, in, its, in its expansion and become its own little Big Bang. So in this model, our universe, our Big Bang is only one manifestation 
of many big bangs. And therefore, the question of what happened before the Big Bang becomes, well, we were in this universe where Big Bangs were popping off all the time. This is a legitimate model for the universe. Doesn't mean it's right, it just means that it's legitimate. And um, the question becomes, is this testable? And there's a lot of debate among people who think about these issues about whether or not such a model for the universe can be tested. And by tested, I really mean meaningfully tested. So let me give you a simple example. If we, if we were talking about Newtonian gravity and we took an apple and we let go of the apple, our, our theory of gravity would say the apple should fall to the ground. So we can test that theory. We take an apple, we hold it, we let it go. And instead of going up, it goes down to the ground and falls to the ground. So we would say then that, gee, our test actually, our, our model actually uh, survived this test. It, it gave results in accord with the uh, predictions of Newtonian gravity. But that's not really a very meaningful test of Newtonian gravity. No one expected the apple to fall upward. Uh, and even if you thought it was a reasonable possibility, there's so many more aspects of gravity, Newtonian gravity, than just up or down. So it isn't a really serious test of the model. So here, in the case of, of this multiverse or eternal inflation, if it indeed is to be tested, and if indeed it is to be real science, which involves it being tested, um, there may, needs to be meaningful tests that can be done. And people argue about it one way or the other, whether it can be tested. Um, if it cannot be tested, then I think it's questionable whether you could say that this is science. If it can be tested or if it can be falsified in a meaningful way, then, um, then that's interesting. And it's something that really should be attempted. So this is what eternal inflation is. And um, if, if we make progress in these areas in the next few years, it'll be a major paradigm shift in our understanding of the universe. Because it goes on, on and on and on in more, more aspects. Let me mention just briefly one other uh, interesting uh, um, puzzle in the universe for which we may have a solution. And that is that um, in our universe, there's almost equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the early universe. But when the antimatter in the early universe all annihilated, um, what we were left with was a bunch of radiation or photons in the universe and some protons, not antiprotons in the universe. In other words, there was a net excess of protons over antiprotons. And the ratio is today that for every proton in the universe, there's about 10 billion photons, which means that in the early universe, for every proton, there were 10 billion minus one antiprotons in the early universe. So the universe was remarkably in its early stage, it was remarkably uh, uh, symmetric with regard to matter and antimatter. Today, it's not symmetric. The antimatter has all gone away, it's all annihilated. And what's left is the residual matter in the universe. But that raises the question, why is it matter rather than antimatter? Why were we left with protons rather than antiprotons? It's a really good question. And interestingly enough, um, there are answers to that question that people have come up with. The problem is that I use the plural. There are answers to the question. There are several models for how this might have happened. And um, there are theories like grand unified theories, which predict there should be uh, net excess of matter over antimatter in the universe. But until we understand exactly what the correct grand unified theory is, we can't, uh, we can't make a prediction of exactly what that number is. And similarly, for several of the other explanations, uh, um, uh, it's, it's at this point impossible to make a clear prediction of what that asymmetry should be. So that's something to stay tuned for. What we do know is that these models predict that the proton is unstable. And people have looked for the decay of protons. Um, I think the current limits are, I don't know exactly, something like 10 raised to the 32nd power years on the lifetime of the proton. And there's almost no way you can do an experiment on a proton that lasts that long a time because our universe is only 18 billion years old. 
in our lifetime is less than 100 years old. But what you could do is, if you want to test it, is look at 10 to the 32 protons, which means that you people do experiments in the in the ocean, looking for decay of protons located in water. And so far, such proton decay has not yet been observed. So this is still a paradigm shift to happen because we don't know what the right answer is. So let me bring this to a close, uh, almost on time. Um, there are still many, many unanswered questions that we want to deal with. When we think about the large scale universe, what is the dark energy? We really don't know what it is, nor do we know why it's 73% of the universe. Why isn't it 100%? Why isn't it 0%? And then what is this dark matter stuff? I mean, it's got to be there because we measure it, but, um, but we really don't know for sure what it is. How do we explain the asymmetry between matter and antimatter in the early universe? Are there these multiverses? These are, these are really key questions that will lead to probably revolutions in our thinking as we solve them in the years ahead. I think my main point is that we started out 100 years ago making slow progress in our understanding of the universe, but the questions keep compounding. And we're faced with some really interesting questions today we made, we're making a lot more progress today, but there's still some big questions to be answered. And some of that will be answered observationally. I think one of the great hopes, for example, in the next few years is that when the James Webb telescope is launched, that they'll be able to see for the first time the earliest stars that formed in the universe. We've never seen the first generation of stars. And I think that will be a major revelation when we actually can see that first generation of stars. That's gonna be one of the big results of the James Webb telescope. But the bottom line is the 21st century does promise to be really very much as interesting and probably a whole lot more interesting than the 20th century. So anyone for a new paradigm shift? So oh, thank you very much. That was marvelous, George. Uh, excellent explanations, though I am glad that Mike's promising no, uh, no exams. <laughs> so we have questions, we have many questions. First from Doug, does the expansion of the universe affect the transit time of light from one galaxy to another? And if so, can you still compute the time when it was emitted as the distance computed from the redshift divided by the speed of light? So that's a really great question. So yes, the, the expansion of the universe does affect the light travel time between a galaxy and us. Um, in the nearby universe, that means at distant or at, at distances or look back times less than the edge of the universe, it's really easy to calculate because the redshift is just proportional to the velocity and is proportional to the distance. But as you go back further and further in time, when you measure galaxies that emitted their light further and further uh, or, or a longer and longer time ago, then it becomes more complicated and you have to actually use relativity to calculate what you're asking for. So it becomes much more complicated, but certainly still calculable. Uh, Mike, you're muted. <laughs> thank you, sorry. Um, yeah, uh, thank you, George. And uh, I say we have a bunch of questions coming in. Please keep them coming. Uh, and also, if you want to look at the questions already there, you can upvote them and sort of help us prioritize what you think is most interesting. So uh, next question we have is from uh, Katiana. Uh, just a question about what this, what this means to all of us, right? Why is there no dark matter on Earth, or is there? There is, of course, dark matter on Earth. We're passing through dark matter all of the time. Um, there is dark matter in our galaxy. I tried to indicate that to you when I showed you the rotation curves of galaxies. So our galaxy is just chock full of dark matter and the earth you know, uh, revolves around the sun which is, and the sun rotates around the galaxy. So the sun is a, uh, and the earth is participating in motion around the galaxy and therefore it's moving through dark matter all the time. But that dark matter so weakly interacts with anything else that it just passes through the earth and it passes through you. So you never notice it. So yes, we, we are coexisting with dark matter. We just don't notice it. Another perplexity from Jeff, uh, excuse me, from Jim. Uh, 
I'm sorry. If I'm wrong, what is the universe expanding into? Again, a really good question. Um, the universe doesn't have to be expanding into anything because um, the universe, um, there, there are two possibilities. One is that the universe is infinite, in which case it's, it's always there and it's just, things are just moving apart. And if it doubles in size, well, twice infinity is still infinity. But the universe can also be finite. It's possible for the universe to be a, a, a finite size. And I can, let me try to explain what I mean by going down one dimension. And we, you know, we know that our universe is three-dimensional. But imagine for the moment that the universe was two-dimensional. And imagine the surface of a sphere or a balloon. And so we're two-dimensional creatures crawling around on the surface of a, of a balloon. Um, as we crawl around the surface of the balloon, uh, um, you know, as long as we are not allowed to look into the third dimension, everything is fine. We just look along the surface of the balloon and we can observe other, uh, other creatures moving around on that surface. Now, what if somebody blows up the balloon and makes it get bigger with time? If it gets bigger with time, then the galaxies or the people or the creatures on the surface of the balloon would simply move further apart. The balloon would be expanding, and you could say from your vantage point, it's expanding into the third dimension. But if you're just a creature on this two-dimensional balloon, you can't measure the third dimension. So the surface itself is not expanding into anything, but it's only because of our perspective looking from the outside that we could say that the balloon is expanding into an additional dimension. And if you move everything up by one dimension and talk about our three-dimensional universe, for a finite three-dimensional universe, it's quite analogous to it being a sphere expanding into a four-dimensional uh, universe. So, um, so the answer to your question is yes, the universe can be expanding, but it's not expanding into anything in the same dimensions that we live in. If it's expanding into something, it's into a higher dimension. <laughs> It's tough to wrap your head around. Uh, question, <laughs> question from Jim. Um, is eternal inflation with bubbles a bit like champagne? Is there, is there an analogy there? <laughs> uh, well, that's quite a name. Maybe it should be more like beer. But uh, 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 there is some analogy. Because if you think about champagne, uh, um, champagne, if you have a glass of champagne, bubbles form spontaneously. And then, uh, and the bubbles will grow as they rise to the top of the champagne. And similarly, in eternal inflation is the individual bubbles will spontaneously come into existence and then they'll grow. But eventually, un unlike the bubbles in champagne, they don't keep growing. Eventually they, they grow less rapidly than the rest of the universe. So they in some sense drop out. Question from Jeff, what is the contribution of the Hawking theory? What is the contribution of the Hawking theory? Well, I mean, it really depends on what Hawking theory you're talking about. Usually when people talk about the Hawking theory, they're talking about black holes and black hole radiation. And, um, and, and Steve Hawking made just a tremendous contribution to our understanding of black holes by pointing out that black holes even can radiate thermal radiation. Uh, um, due to interesting quantum effects that take place near their surface. So all of that is very interesting, but it is probably not relevant to the story that we're talking about now. What could be relevant is that some people have argued that cold dark matter consists of black holes from the early universe. And if that's the case, then Hawking radiation would be a problem if those black holes were, were too uh, unmassive or not massive enough. Um, and that could change the nature of dark matter over time. So it, it, Hawking radiation serves to uh, serves as one of the constraints on possible black holes as dark matter. Question from Roger. Can you give a qualitative intuitive explanation as to why the galaxies and dark matter form the filamentary structure in the universe, just from gravity rather than some more uniform, even if locally concentrated distribution? That's a great question. It's a really tough question. So I think my my biggest answer to you is no. Um, I think that uh, I think uh, I think I could argue that uh, um, 
that if there are regions in the universe that are less dense than everywhere else, those less dense regions, you could argue, uh, are unable to collapse. They, 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 they start expanding faster than the rest of the universe because gravity is acting more strongly on everywhere outside of those bubbles. And so the bubbles tend to grow relative to the material around them. So you can kind of understand just from a simple idea of, of gravity, why bubbles might grow. And then if you think about a universe that's filled with areas that have bubbles and think about the areas, the, the regions between bubbles, that leads to a filamentary type of structure. It leads to walls that if viewed edge on appear to be filaments. So, so my answer to you is it, for me at least, it's easier to think of it in terms of not where the matter is, but rather where the matter isn't and um, understand how the bubbles actually grow relative to the rest of the universe and therefore squeeze those other regions between them that become walls and filaments. So Theodore wants to move us from talking about bubbles to foam. Feynman talked about quantum foam with white holes and black holes acting on each other. Would this foam be dark energy and the holes making the internal the eternal inflation? So um, interesting question. Certainly uh, when people talk about dark energy, they talk about quantum effects that have bear some resemblance to the foam that uh, Theodore was talking about. But uh, in fact, what the language people use today to describe dark energy is that it represents vacuum energy, energy of the vacuum. Now, you know, what does that mean? Um, uh, normally, if I would say that a region has a complete vacuum, that means that there's nothing in it. There's no matter, there's no nothing there. Well, dark energy is not matter, so that's consistent. But dark energy re represents a field or an entity that can exist anywhere in, throughout the universe, including in regions that are a vacuum. And um, the existence of that dark energy carries with it a certain amount of energy. And it's that energy or energy of the vacuum that represents what, what people refer to as dark energy. Because energy in a vacuum behaves differently than energy of other kinds of energy like mass energy. I know I've just given you a bunch of words. It isn't really an explanation, but I'm really trying to tell you the language that people use. Um, but I'm not sure that I have a simple explanation for it, um, except to say that it's an entity that has to exist everywhere. And therefore, and it has a quantum origin and therefore carries energy. Um, from Patrick, how do you reconcile the law of conservation of energy with the accelerating expansion of the universe, or, or can you? So um, uh, you can, uh, um, because really the law of conservation of energy is a local law, only applies to regions. You, you draw a boundary and you would normally say that um, uh, uh, every, the energy in that region has to, has to be uh, uh, constant. Well, if the universe is accelerating, you could say galaxies are moving away from each other faster, and therefore that must take energy. But remember, we also have a source of energy, namely dark energy. And so dark energy can, is, is the entity that's responsible for giving energy to those accelerating galaxies. So it's not as though it violates conservation of energy. It's similar, I mean, just step back for a moment and think about what happens if there's no dark energy and the expansion of the universe is slowing down. You could say, well, if galaxies are slowing down, if their expansion is slowing down relative to one another, if they're losing energy, the motion of the galaxies is losing energy. But in our language, we would say, ah, but that energy is going into potential energy. And so um, there's always a playoff between energy of motion or kinetic energy and pot gravitational potential energy. And similarly with dark energy, uh, um, there can also be an, an, an additional effect. So dark energy can exchange with uh, the motion of galaxies. From Patrick, how do you reconcile the law of conservation of energy with the accelerating expansion of the universe? I think we just asked that one. Or can you? 
No, I'm sorry. Stuart then. Is it all that dark matter and dark energy are really our perceptions of the interaction of mass from other dimensions with the visible matter in our own three-dimensional universe? It's an interesting question. Um, uh, whether or not there's other, there's, there could be real mass somewhere else that's causing us to, uh, to, to mistakenly uh, think about, for example, dark matter. In fact, if some years ago, many years ago, I briefly toyed with a model that some people were talking about for this, the idea of shadow, shadow universe, two universes occupying the same spatial place at the same time, but with the matter in each universe not interacting except through gravity. And, um, you know, it's an interesting concept and, um, and people have talked about it, but at the end of the day, no such idea has actually worked out into a viable model. So yes, you can talk about it, you can think about it. It's, a, it's not a crazy idea. Uh, but it's an idea that has not, at least so far, worked. A uh, uh, question from Roger. Building on Stuart Usum's question, read dark energy and dark energy possibly being higher dimensional energy. Could it be magnetoelectric instead of electromagnetic? Uh, and what do you think it is? So I don't know what magnetoelectric is compared to electromagnetic. Um, uh, to me, those are synonyms. Uh, so I'm not sure, I don't really understand that piece of the question. In terms of what I think the dark energy is, I think, I really don't think it has anything to do with electromagnetism at all, because uh, if it did, we would, we would, we would detect the charge, electromagnetism involves charges, and we would affect, we would detect the charges and we would detect electromagnetic uh, radiation uh, uh, from those charges. In terms of what do I think it is, I am completely well, I, I was going to say agnostic on what it is, but maybe the better word is befuddled um, because I actually have no idea what it is. Well, Karen asks, speaking of which, how do you know dark energy has energy if we don't know what it is? How do, how do we know that dark energy has energy if we don't know what it is? Uh, again, that's a fair question. Um, what we do know, is that something is making the universe accelerate. Um, we know something is making the universe accelerate. We know whatever that something is, we, we would hope that it would be consistent with the laws of physics as we know them in terms of particle motions and gravity and stuff like that. Um, uh, we know that the Einstein cosmological constant essentially has energy associated with it. And so um, if you generalize it to dark energy, uh, that would also have energy associated with it. Now, is it possible that you come up with a different model that involves something other than dark energy? Yeah, I mean, and it, it is certainly possible, but since the acceleration of the universe involves in some sense injection of energy into the universe, it would seem to me that you have to have energy from somewhere in order to do that. And um, so, uh, so it's hard for me to conceive of a situation where it doesn't have energy, but I think we should be open to possibilities. A question from Theodore. If dark matter is invisible, how can it be seen or detected or, or what is projected for future detectors? Uh, what are the leading detectors now? Does CERN have some future ways to detect it? Uh, or what are the newest findings on, oh, what is the newest findings on sun pillars? If that's <laughs> well, two different questions there, okay. very, very much two different questions. Um, uh, how can you detect dark matter if it doesn't interact? Well, in fact, the models of dark matter that we're talking about, like the Fotino or the Axion are in principle detectable. Of course they exert gravity, so that part is there. But um, do they interact with matter at all? In both cases, the answer is yes, they do interact with matter, but exceptionally weak they, do they interact. It's because of that weakness that it's hard to detect them. They go right through detectors. So one way you detect, for example, or try to detect the Fotino is to go to an accelerator like the Large Hadron Collider, build the biggest, strongest beam of particles you can, and then um, try to build the biggest detector that you can. The big, you know, even if, even if there's just a very small fraction of uh, photinos that actually interact with matter, 
if you build a big enough chunk of matter, then you'll actually see some interactions. And so um, that's the idea there, to build, build detectors that have as much mass as possible so that you can detect those particles. And so that's what people try to do with, for example, accelerators. And as I say, there are, there are um, experiments going on now. Another thing you can do, and which has been done, is to go deep inside of mines uh, on Earth and build particle detectors underground that would detect the particles from the uh, galactic, from the galaxy as they pass through the Earth. And if you build a big enough detector, you might have a chance of doing it. And you have the added advantage that you might see an effect, a six month or an annual effect because the uh, Earth goes around the sun and therefore the way we strike these particles, the angles will be different on an annual basis. So you should detect a yearly signal. So that's one thing. Those are the kinds of things you can do to actually detect these particles. Question from Jeff, and I'm gonna have to have your help, I think, in formulating this. Please discuss when the time seems right, why the observed behavior of muons challenges the standard model when it is only off by 0.1% of what the standard model predicts? So I think, I think that question was directed at recent results that just came out that discovered that the, st well, that the standard particle, the standard model of particle physics might have a small error. And uh, let me just back up and say that the standard model of particle physics, which involves quarks, gluons, electrons, photons, um, uh, w, Zs, all these interesting particles, that standard model, which has been in existence for 25 or more years, has been remarkably successful. It, there has been no experiment so far until recently that seemed to be inconsistent with the standard model. There may be physics beyond the standard model, but, um, but nothing seems yet to have been inconsistent until recently. And recently, um, it's been reported literally a few weeks ago that there were deviate, there were measurements of uh, muons that showed that the uh, uh, magnetic moment of the muon was a little bit different than what was predicted. And what do I mean by a little bit different? Uh, it was a four sigma result, which means that it, it was highly improbable, but not impossible that the two, that the measurements were consistent with the theory. Um, usually, um, usually particle physicists don't report results until they're five sigma results. So this is not yet reportable as a, as a real inconsistency, but it, it's gotten a lot of press and it is certainly something to think about and worry about. Does it mean the theory is wrong? Well, you know, don't bet on it yet. As I say, the data isn't strong enough to make that claim yet. Uh, it might be true though, that it's, that the, that the data is right. In which case there may have to be some modification to the theory. I don't know enough about the theory to actually tell you whether that modification would be easy or difficult or whether this result points to something fundamentally beyond the standard model of particle physics. From Roger, uh, I understand that the multi-universe idea, multi, yeah, multi-universe idea comes from inflation. Since inflation has now considerable success, is that a kind of meaningful test or corroboration of the multi-universe idea? Great question. Um, I would say it shows consistency, but, I, but we don't really yet understand the detailed nature of inflation. We understand the concept. We have detailed models for how inflation might work, but we have not, we're not anywhere close yet being, being able to distinguish between different models of inflation, much less proving them right. So, um, so the answer to your question is, we really need to understand the inflationary model more, more deeply in order to say that it really fundamentally predicts uh, uh, eternal inflation. Let me go a step further or back up a second. What we really want to understand, you know, if you, if you gave me the magic wand and told me I could have anything I wanted for Christmas, um, what I'd really want is a really good and correct theory of everything. So what I'd like is a theory which encompasses all of the interactions of matter, strong, weak, electromagnetic, and gravitational. And that's been the holy grail of physics for 100 years. Um, 
three of those have been combined in, in one way or another. But, but as yet, uh, we're not sure of any model that includes gravity. There is such a model called string theory. String theory is a potential theory of everything. We don't know if it's a correct theory of everything, but at least it's a theory of everything. It's very hard to calculate stuff using string theory, but at least in principle, if string theory were correct and could be tested, then in principle, we could use string theory to calculate what inflation looks like and actually to calculate whether or not eternal inflation is a necessary or, or uh, an inevitable outcome of inflation in the early universe. So, um, so if we had the real, the correct physics theory, we could actually make that prediction, but we're not there yet. So Kenneth wants to uh, place a mood against dark matter. And he asked, is there a possibility that dark matter doesn't exist, but rather that our understanding of gravity is incomplete? Great question. Um, in fact, that was, that's a question that a number of people have asked since the discovery of dark matter. Does the, should the theory of gravity instead be modified? So um, in fact, this even got a name, uh, MOND, for Modified Newtonian Dynamics. Um, so people came up with a theory, an alternative theory to Newtonian gravity, which was really clever. It could explain the data in, in galaxies, the rotation of galaxies. It could explain uh, um, some of the data in clusters of galaxies, particularly rich clusters of galaxies. So it was, a it was in some sense a viable model. It, wasn't a, it was not a viable model that was based on a theory or a fundamental theory. It was simply a model that was put together to explain the data, but still maybe that could have been right. The problem for, from my perspective, there's two fundamental problems with modified Newtonian gravity. Um, one is theoretical and that is if it were true, it would be really hard to construct a large scale model for the whole universe. So we would be back to where we were in 1910 with no self-consistent model of the universe. That's not a good argument really, it's more of a, an aesthetic ar argument that I would make. But in terms of data driven arguments, uh, people have tested that model by looking at the intermediate routine between very large systems and smaller systems. And in particular, uh, one of the galaxies uh, um, that's actually quite well known now, it's called M87. Uh, you probably read about it not too long ago because that's where people took a picture of a black hole at the center of a galaxy. That was the galaxy they took the picture of, uh, the black hole at the center of. Anyway, M87 is an X-ray source. And um, you can look at the X-ray emission from M87 and ask whether or not it is consistent with modified Newtonian gravity. And the answer is no. Um, when they actually subjected this theory or this idea to, to the test of looking at intermediate regimes between very large and very small, it didn't pass that test observationally. Having said that, that doesn't mean that tomorrow, if you want to go home, you couldn't come up with a new modified Newtonian theory that would satisfy the tests and might even satisfy me by presenting, by being generalizable into a new model for the large scale universe. So I'm not saying that such a thing couldn't exist. I'm just saying that there is no such reasonable alternative at this time. Well, question from uh, Michael and not me. Uh, what is for you the most interesting question under current serious examination? So uh, I'm gonna break that into two pieces. One, what is the most interesting question intrinsically? I think the question of eternal inflation and whether it's true or not is interesting because it, it, it impinges on metaphysics, it impinges on, um, uh, on, our, on our understanding of the large scale universe, and it gets around this horrible question that we would other have to, otherwise have to ask of what happened before the Big Bang, because it answers that question. Um, so I, that's, that's the most interesting thing to me in terms of the one I'd really like to know the answer to. On the other hand, I'm realistic. Uh, I'd like to also, think about questions that might be answered in my lifetime. And um, I think the a real, more realistic one concerns dark energy and dark matter. I'd really like to know what dark energy and dark matter is. And in fact, if you made me, if you held my feet to the fire, I'd even settle for dark matter. I'd love it if the dark matter particle were found. 
Kathiana asked uh, about movies. Can you suggest any great movies relating to the world of astrophysics? Ooh. Um, it's interesting. I don't watch that many that are astrophysics related because of uh, because it just drives me up the wall sometimes when they uh, play footloose and fancy free with uh, uh, the science. Um, uh, you know, uh, um, I think the, the old Carl Sagan movie on uh, uh, called Contact, I think, is an interesting one to watch because it, it does talk about uh, uh, contacts with other civilizations, which is something which is another burgeoning area in astrophysics. I mean, one of the great, you know, I, I know I've talked about the large scale universe, but I'll just put in a plug for astrobiology by saying it is quite amazing in the last 25 years. We went from having no planets that we've discovered around other stars to having thousands, literally five, 6,000 planets that we've now discovered around other stars. We now know about planetary systems, solar systems. And while we always assumed for many, many years that our solar system was typical of solar systems in our galaxy, we now know that our own solar system is rather atypical. So um, we've learned all kinds of interesting things. This isn't my area of research, but it's it's certainly it's certainly an area that I think is in burgeoning. From Rebecca, what is the best spot on the UCSC campus to observe the universe? <laughs> um, okay, I won't give you the facetious answer. Um, uh, um, I think. Uh, uh, I think that there's a couple of telescopes on the top of Applied Science uh, on Engineering One, which uh, um, actually are probably the best sites at the UCSC campus. Uh, the problem is you want a dark sky, and um, that's kind of hard to do. But um, but yeah, I think on the top of a building as far away from lights as possible. And the last question from Kenneth. Uh, any advice for undergraduates looking to have an impactful career in research? My advice is start research early. I mean, um, as an undergraduate, that for me personally, um, uh, you know, somebody asked me about sun colors, which interestingly enough was what I worked on as an undergraduate. To me, one of the mo momentous moments of my life was when uh, I did a project on sun colors and I got, uh, I was able to explain something that hadn't been explained before. And I went and showed it to my advisor who was supervising me. And he said, gee, George, do you realize that at this moment in time, you and I are the only two people in the world who understand this phenomenon. And I thought that was just the coolest thing. I did, that moment was the moment I decided I wanted to do research. So I would just encourage you if you're really interested in and getting involved is to find a research, go talk to some faculty members, see if there's research pro projects that you can be involved in and get involved in a research project. And, and you know, not only will it help you develop your own skills, but it'll, you know, if you want to go to graduate school, having been involved in research as an undergraduate is a great, you know, is a great thing to have on your record as you apply to graduate schools. So, uh, but don't just, don't do it for that reason. Do it because it's so fundamentally rewarding. Fabulous. With that, please, a big round of applause in the Q&A box at the bottom for our Professor Emeritus George Blumenthal. Thank you for sharing your fascinating insights with us this evening in a way that even a politics major could follow. This talk has been recorded and it will be available on the UC Santa Cruz Arts and Lectures YouTube channel in a few days. Now I want to put in a plug and I want to go back to the note that Mac had in the beginning about uh, George's key contributions to education of those who might not otherwise get an education. I just want to say that you too can contribute. We uh, have a scholarship fund through the Alumni Council that we, uh, we give to a few dozen students every year, and we would love to give it to more. So please look up that scholarship fund and contribute. 
Also a big round of thanks to the staff and alumni of uh, alumni and special events offices who set up this online forum. Thank you, Shana, Diana, Paulina, and Kristen. Now our next event is again on the second Monday as, as with every month, this time June 14th. And it's with Lila Parsons, the professor of electrical and computer engineering in the Baskin School of Engineering. She'll be speaking on electronics and electric drives for future land and air transportation. So stay tuned for breakthroughs. Meanwhile, on Thursday, May 13th, There'll be a lab side chat with Stephanie Brody, project scientist at UC Santa Cruz and researcher with the Fisheries Collective Program. Then on May 19th, the next Crawl Lecture will highlight a Stanford UCSC collaboration that brought a diagnostic genomic lab to UCSC. Or you can paddle with fellow slugs out on the Santa Cruz Harbor on Saturday, May 22nd, for one of the campus's first in-person events in over a year. All these and more are found at events.ucst.edu. So we see Santa Cruz Alumni Association. Thank you for joining us. And please come back on June 14th, 6.30 p.m. for our next virtual event.